Yes. Today things have gotten ugly enough that we view homelessness. It's just another lifestyle that might be befall you if you're unlucky. But there's really no great concern over there. Um, I'm beginning to think that the same thing is coming with food. I'm wondering uh, if you agree with me. And I guess my other point is, do you think that actions like you've outlined here with food mm -hmm. need to be taken with regard to housing as well because of this fact that it's tend to be viewed that housing is just a privilege yeah. if you can afford it? It's already happening. Yeah. In Detroit, there's a foreclosure. I mean, folks are mobilizing. Mm -hmm. So somebody will give you a phone call and they'll say, we need you at 1664 West out of Drive. Mm -hmm. And a whole bunch of people will come and will stop the, the banks from closing, or even placing the bins on the property. Mm -hmm. A national welfare right for is <laughs> exactly than that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, there are already these kinds of things happening. I think it's interesting. I did a presentation in Montpellier, uh, France. And just this one thing that just sort of really touched me, we have soup kitchens and they have what's called restaurant de cool. Restaurant de cool. Mm -hmm. What a different way of looking. And somebody from France was like, okay, don't get all excited. Don't <laughs> <laughs> get happy, it's not like we, you know, embrace it. But I was thinking, it's like, well, no, I mean, at least you can start with, you know, food is, you know, you shouldn't have the stigma around not being able to, especially given the, the structural conditions that stand between people and healthy food. If you look at, you know, just this, this image, can you imagine? I mean, I remember when I was in college, on the bus, going to the grocery store, and I was able-bodied. I didn't have children. I didn't, you know, I didn't have to bring milk and my salad. I didn't have the kinds of issues that families have experienced. And so the idea that people are taking matters into their own hands and saying there's a lot, I'm getting the soil tested, right? There's a whole conversation around making sure that that's, that's safe. But um, yeah, there's mobilization around issues of housing, issues of education. I mean, I don't know what's happening. I, I don't know. And, and one of the things that really has been difficult is being here and watching everything on the news while wow, my comrades are there and so I'm like, okay, y'all give me something to do. I do something. Uh, but it is, it, it's really, um, it's, a, it's something happening in the city and I don't know, I don't know, um, I, I do uh, think about the quote, uh, until the lion learns to speak, history will glorify the hunter. Mm -hmm. I just feel like we all have to be we have to be the lion. We have to be the one to tell the story. We have to be the one to tell the story from our perspective. Yes. Hi, welcome. I'm Sandy Liddell. I teach at Alpha American Study. Hi. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm really emotional right in this moment because I am a Detroiter, mm -hmm. but I've been here for almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. And every time I go home, it hurts yeah. deeply. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to try to be brief about my questions. And I think there are two or three. One is that there are grocery stores in the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dan Carmody, the president of Eastern Market, I took him to dinner last night. I took him to La Brioche. He's here doing some work with Madison. Madison is asking him to do some work, and so uh, he was here. I was like, Dan, let me take you to dinner. Um, and so uh, the, the issue with Eastern Market is that it's centrally located. It is uh, an open-air market, one of the longest, uh, longest contiguous um, open-air markets, uh, farmer's markets in the country. It started in the 1800s. Um, on the weekends, it can get about 40,000 uh, visitors on the one Saturday. Um, it's, you know, it's difficult to navigate if you have a family, but, uh, you know, it, you know and, and even, you know, given the economic conditions, they were considering cutting the buses on Saturdays, which is the only day that the Eastern Market is open, so that would have complicated people's mobility. Um, so people do go to the Eastern Market. Um, the grocery stores that are, um, that, that it, you know, they're the fringe markets or the single owned, and what we know is that the people who own the store don't live in the community. So whoever those people, you know, whatever identification, racial identification, class identification, there's no connection to the community, and so there's no sort of sense of responsibility for what they carry. Um, one of my colleagues, Kami Pagacucci, is doing some amazing work in terms of uh, what's called healthy corner stores. So what she's doing is she's saying, if there's this market on the corner, what kind of conversation do I need to have with this store owner to get him to think about growing, or to, to, uh, to think about uh, offering healthy food, uh, fresh produce, and can I get the food that's grown in these urban gardens into these corner stores so that we don't have to ship stuff from Chile, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are lots of things that are happening in terms of who's coming, uh, who, who's uh, 
uh, coming to the table and that kind of thing. But yes, Eastern Market is an option, but mobility-wise, I mean, it's you know, it's a pretty you know, just it's, it's, it, it, yeah. It, but and the thing is, the reason that Detroit is not a quote food desert is because Detroit is not at a loss for food. There's lots of food. Eastern Market is a major hub for the Midwest. Tons and tons of food, I mean, comes from there and goes all over Chicago, maybe even here. But the reality is it goes from Eastern Market and skips over the black and brown folks who live in the cities in exchange for, right, the high fructose corn syrup, the high carbon <coughs> hydrogenated uh, processed foods that end up in the store. So, yes, and I'm emotional too. I'm just like, this folks is since you know, when you see a city that you love, and I think one of the many reasons that I love the city so much is because there's a resilience, there's a scrappiness. You can see in Detroit, and somebody, you're from Detroit. I'm like, how do you know? <laughs> right? There is something about folks who come from a place um, where uh, 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 somebody said, you know, you've never had to apologize for your blackness. And some service sort of spaces, I was like, no, I never thought about that. But no, I was black, my mayor was black, the town was black. And so there was a different sort of framework. And so, yeah, there, there is a love for a city that, uh, that won't die. So my friends are like, you're a Detroit now. So I'm like, yep. <laughs> Always. Ah, ah. Yes. Yes, Ty. Hi. Um, in regards to the urban uh, agricultural land that you're actually planning yes. on, do citizens have to buy that land in order to grow on that land? Yes. Or maybe you're No, no, no. I'm, I'm, do, they have to, do they have to buy the land to grow on right, that right. land? official legitimate purchase of the land. And the process of purchasing land legitimately has been backlogged because the city has not been functioning properly. So while people were able to buy land, because the system wasn't working properly, people were just going ahead and, you know, it's better to ask for forgiveness and permission in some cases. Um, and so what we see is that because, okay, so you have the situation, like the sister, uh, Atisha, you know, she's got this big, huge, um, a forest on the corner of her street, and people look and they say, "Oh no, that's not desirable." So she goes in and she does all the work to create this urban, this, this little community garden. And then the developer comes over and they say, "Wow, well, prime is down, children are playing, houses are going up. This looks like a good piece of property." And so there are these struggles, these battles over how do we see the city moving forward, and how can we create a how can we create a space so that we make decisions based on the greatest number and not the one with the biggest pocket? Mm -hmm. And so that's what this battle is about, right? The hand land grab, the fighting against the financial manager. Don't take away our right to vote. Don't take away our land. Don't take away our water. Somebody will make me act up. <laughs> right? And so the reality is that there are these battles, these struggles, and it's happening right before our face. And you, if you think Detroit is an example, and it is an extreme, but I promise you in some places, in some cities I've been to, and it's not too far from this, you know, economic crisis continues, the lack of access to food continues, the condition continues, Detroit becomes a bellwether, right? Um, so if we don't think about what cities should look like and how we do so in a sustainable model where we invite everybody to the table, we don't say this is what you're going to do, um, then we're going to do some of the issues that, that don't happen. There's a question here, I see you. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you. Yeah. Um, and I saw that it was always like locked up. Like, that's that's what I was going to say to her question too. 
he had, he had these fences. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it, to me, it sent this message that you are not welcome. Yes. Right? Like we redefine what community means. Right. And community is folks who have access to smart. And then, and, then, and then they have a program in there, and then they say, why won't they come? Right. Because right. when you're not there, you lock it up. You tell me, I can't, you know, you, you send a message. This is a gated community <laughs> in my hood. You will come and co opt this square and say, this is mine. I'm sorry, go ahead, did you tell me? <laughs> I mean, and that would be that would be the argument. And so I think for my roommate and I who were doing kind of social justice work, we had some issues with it. But I didn't I didn't I didn't necessarily hear from other folks in the community that they took issue with it. It was just like something yeah. that they witnessed. Yeah. But what got me was that when I would go to the farmers market, I would see the same folks in that garden selling at the farmer market. Yeah. I'm like, you're not necessarily selling to the folks in the community though. Right. For yeah. me, it was an issue that I had to go to the farmer's market right. far away from my apartment to get the produce instead of going to the bodega around the corner. Right, right, right. Um, and so living there for a couple of years, I started to see that not only was the community garden somewhat problematic, but I saw that it was becoming an indicator for uh, gentrification. Yes. And yes. so yes. it's yes. like these yes. road districts yes. create yes. this community garden. Now yes. you have folks who are moving in, yes. and folks are being pushed out. Yes. A friend of mine, uh, Patrick Crouch, wrote a, a, an interesting piece. If you email me, um, I can send it to you. And he, he's sort of asking that question, right? Um, community gardens and gentrification, what's the relationship? Um, one seems to follow the other. We don't want to say which one, but, you know, somehow, you know, so yeah, so so there's there's a, that school of thought that, that is there. And it's for the same reasons, right, that I just said. You know, crime goes down, quality of life, the kids are playing, neighborhood looks good, people plant flowers, and then somebody comes in and says, Okay, I want to be on this line. I want to pay five dollars for the house that two years from now is going to be six million dollars. Slight exaggeration, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to continue on a comment that she had made um, when you're looking at the success in Detroit of this, uh, these practices. Have you seen the same practices in other cities oh, yeah. that are facing the same difficulty? Yeah, I know folks in Brooklyn. Um, there are lots of folks in Brooklyn that are involved in, in agriculture in the same way. There's a group called the Black Farmers Urban Gardeners Conference every uh, every other year. They're convening this year. So it's a conversation around folks who, who do this. Um, there are folks, uh, relationship with folks in Florida and um, Atlanta. Um, so there are in places where there are lots of black folks. Black folks are considering <coughs> returning to the soil as a strategy for um, you know, just responding to it. And see, so the, the organization is saying, well, it's not just about, because you can talk about different models, right? You can talk about those models who grow the food and give the food for free. But then the thing is, you know, teach a man to fish. That whole kind of thing. And so, I mean, it doesn't mean that everybody has to grow, but at least we all sort of have to, you know, just sort of think about food in a particular way. And when you're involved in that system, you really have a respect for that pair, right? <laughs> and so just, you know, and, and so, you know, when you have these conversations, um, you, 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 you're saying, if we can be in control of food, what else can we do? <laughs> we can take the school. We can take the, you know, I mean, so it, it becomes just one mechanism, one vehicle, one entree into really sort of um, being uh, more of an agent of, of and demonstrating your own agency. Uh, you want to No. Oh, I thought you had a hand up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Space. Yeah. Uh, from yeah. Folk. Yeah. It's really you know, and Detroit is. I know in some ways Detroit is is an example, and in other ways it's sort of an anomaly. You know, just sort of, um, you know. So, in, okay. So up starting with the the rebellion of '67, uh, that was a white flight that was pretty complete around '70s. Uh, black folks stayed in the city, stayed in the city, stayed in the city until 20. 10, when black folks started leaving the city, because, you know, black folks of, of means, right? Middle class black folks start moving into the suburbs. And so, um, so there's been a mass migration of black folks in the last, you know, few years. Um, no, 2000, I think, 2000. And in 2010, they saw this sort of reverse migration where whites were moving more into the city, um, into those spaces. 
Uh, and now, I mean, just to find, just to try to find some place to rent, mm -hmm. reasonable in certain neighborhoods, um, it's, it's really, really, uh, it's really expensive, surprisingly. Um, and so when you think about um, the racial dynamics, majority of the folks in the movement, they come from, uh, they are working class and some are unemployed and what have you. But it is that sort of granola crunching, you know, you know, those of us that are Birkenstock wearing, you know. And so how do we frame the conversation in such a way so you get young parents, you know, that hold like somewhere between 15, 13, 14, and people, you know, the children look at you and they're like, I ain't no slave. It's like, wait, boo-boo. Before there was slavery, let's think about the other examples. How can we frame this in a different way? And so you see some of the class dynamics in the movement in terms of black folks, but not nearly the degree to which you do in places like Brooklyn and LA and you know, you know, so there are, you know, you do see it, but not the same, not the same, uh, not the same, same degree. Yes. children involved on a very personal level because this is a history. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, with, when you integrate food into a family tree, there's a certain kind of an interest that comes from that. And in, in addition to the fact that even if they don't use the information now, it'll be something that they can use, especially when you talk about, like, sustainable, you know, corn crunches. This, this elder who's in the humor of the, of the guardian angels, and, you know, she was sitting there, she was telling us the story. She was like, you know, I got so sick of folks stealing my tomatoes. You know what I did? She said, I went out and I started putting powder water, powdered milk in my water. So when the water dried on the tomato, it turned white. People thought I had used pesticide. <laughs> That's how I kept them out of my tomato. They did all kinds of strategies and techniques. So when people talk about this organic farming and it's like, you know, get this 
tub of seed for a hundred dollars and get this for seventeen and get this hoop house for forty five hundred dollars and all this kind of stuff. Our elders didn't have those kinds of resources and there's some knowledge that they needed to pass down. I do feel some inspiration coming from beautiful places. Like there's this whole hip hop vegan movement that's taken over. I was trying to get deep town to be the site of a vegan fest, a black vegan fest. Seven acres have um, um, uh, uh, dead uh, dead crabs come out. It's a whole bunch of hip hop artists come out there and just be like, hey. And then you're like, I hear this music banging. Um, I didn't know that this was so food. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that we have to use culture, right? Just like she said, if we use culture as a mechanism, as a conduit through which to talk about and to think about agriculture and the importance historically. And it's, it's, you know, it's bad that we have this racialized image of a farmer. Because for me, you know, I thought everybody's parents were grew food. My daddy was winning all kinds of time, you know, having these little bets in the neighborhood. I can make it look better. I can't. <laughs> right, you know, I thought everybody. So, you know, it, it pains me that we don't have a frame of reference. So my job, my obligation, my commitment is to really, and I, there was a whole big, whole big debate after the Super Bowl, God made a farmer, and it was a Dodge truck, and there weren't very many, you know, wasn't fully representative of the people who are, who consider themselves farmers. And so it's my job as somebody who went through, I have my dad as an example. You have me. Let me be an example. Let me show you how, I, I want you to see what falling in love with what you study looks like. I want you to see what passion and skill are. I just, you know, I, you know, I'm like, if I could just do this all day long and twice on Sunday, you wouldn't have to pay, pay me for this. Oh. Because the story is important. And it's important that the people who have this experience be the ones to tell the story. Now, some people can tell the story, but I do feel like there's a particular story for black farmers. Mm -hmm. And they call, you know, you know and, and, and I've been trusted with their words, and I hold them ever so precious. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that you can find something that you love. There's all kinds of things. And then we had uh, back then, there was people who would tell me to teach people how to cook. Okay. Uh, and then you had to bring the stuff that you yeah. like uh, zucchini, zucchini bread and mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. other kinds of things. And it was a really learning experience. But it was because of those roots that it's right. that my parents right. went there. But now I've got kids that won't eat, they don't say they'll eat tomatoes, yeah. but they'll eat uh, pasta, right. they'll eat spaghetti, they'll eat yeah. salsa, but they won't eat a red tomato. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so trying to. Yeah. Uh, Trans, you know, trying to teach my kids and their, my grandkids yeah. how to eat vegetables yeah. in a different kind of way. Yeah. And so one of the things that you were talking about is the education component. Sure. <laughs> how do we take that richness? Yeah, let me tell you this quick story, and I know we got to go. Um, really quick. So, you know, as, a, as somebody who was studying movement, I walked in, I said, look, I want to study. And they were like, okay, we got work for you to do. Before you turn the tape recorder on, you're going to have to do some work. So one of the things that they asked me to do was to be, to do this very compost workshop at the Harvest I'm not crazy about worms. I mean, I had my own worm bin, and the whole, like, I'm good with the worms, as long as I don't see them, but when they can see them on the top of the, and they all like, hey, I'm like, ah. So I go to the kids, and I do this workshop, and I'm like, okay, y'all, let's go do this. And I have my lecture, and I'm like, worms do what? And how are they? And what does that eat? And <laughs> I pop the top on the lid, the kids bump across the table, and they're like, I want a whole one. Here's my worm. I'm like, okay, let's do the worm. So we're doing a worm <laughs> dance. And my name is Billy. My name, you know, so they named the worm. That's my worm. And I just was amazed by how excited the children were. Little boy was like, I want to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and I was really amazed by how much fun they were having. Mm -hmm. And so, if the more we integrate the conversation about food in the school system, mm -hmm. uh, we know the children are.
are changing the habits of their parents because of this stuff of the school system has community gardens that the community runs when the students go home. And so the kids are learning about food that the parents don't know anything about it. Like, oh yeah, we know what zucchini is, and you know, we want zucchini. Mm -hmm. So the children can change dietary habits. It is a difficult age group in there, and I don't have kids, so I can't really say when that clock ticks. I don't know, right, like tweens or something? Um, but I do think that, um, you know, for those who are young enough to give them a dirt, they love it. And then for the other ones who need a little inspiration, let's give them the dead bread. Let's use culture. Let's try to get folks at various stages to sort of understand and embrace and become a part of this movement. And thank you for changing our our Thank you. It's a little, this is just a little taste of what we have planned for the symposium. So if you really didn't get enough of this conversation tonight or conversations like this, we hope that we see you bright and early tomorrow um, spending the day with us. We have some real, if you don't have a schedule, if you haven't registered, you can stop by the registration table, do so. You can pick up a schedule. We have some amazing conversations happening tomorrow, and we really hope to see you and have you a part of it. Can we give um, Dr. White one more hand?